because they were terif- because they were afraid. The end. No, seriously, that's the end. Was it what you expected? What you're familiar with? In case you don't believe me, I'm going to invite you to take that red Bible out from the pew right in front of you. If you're online, feel free to Google it. Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. In the print Bibles here in the sanctuary, I'll even give you the page number. It's number 1067. Mark 16, 1 through 8. I used the NIV on the slides so it matches what's in those Bibles. Verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And then what does it say there in the Bible right after verse 8? The most reliable early manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have Mark 16, 9 through 20. So that's where the original text ended, right after verse 8. Well, that's odd. I mean, both odd in the way that it ends as originally written, which we'll talk about more in a moment, but also odd in that there's a whole bunch of verses here that are not in the earliest manuscripts. So first, some things that are important to know. There are no existing original copies of any of the biblical books. Everything that scholars have to work with is a later manuscript, which essentially just means a copy of something that was an older writing. Most scholars agree that the Gospel of Mark was the earliest of the four and was likely written in the late 60s CE, not the 1960s, the original 60s, before the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 70. There are allusions in this book of Mark that are likely connected to those historical events. For comparison, Matthew and Luke were probably written about 20 years after Mark, still in the first century but a bit later, and John was probably written a few years after Matthew and Luke. So that's also just a reminder that these Gospels were not synchronous, simultaneous accounts of Jesus' life. No guy with a papyrus following Jesus around, taking notes, No documentary style camera. This isn't like the office Jesus edition. In fact, the earliest Greek manuscripts, copies, that still exist today that include the Gospel of Mark are dated from the following two or three centuries. And in those, Mark ends at verse 8. Scholars generally agree that we don't have anything more original or dependable than that. After those manuscripts, there begin popping up later copies that have other possible endings. It almost, but not quite, is like those books I used to read as a kid. Choose Your Own Adventure. Have you read some of those? Think they're actually still making them? I found this one that looks like it is a very recent publication. There is no unicorn involved in any alternate ending to Mark. I'm going to get off that slide real quick. You want to maybe put it back on the, on the main slide. Uh, I don't want to suggest something like that. But in many Bibles, you will find either what is called, super creatively, the shorter ending, which is not even in the version that you have in the pews, or the longer ending verses 9 through 20, as you see them in this Bible. Both of these endings are almost universally considered to not be original to the text of Mark, added by later scribes, copiers, or church-connected folks. Both of these endings, other alternate endings, attempt to resolve this challenging and uncomfortable ending in verse 8. They bring in some concepts and pieces of a story that are more theologically compatible with the other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, John, which of course, by now, in the second, third, fourth centuries, were also in wide circulation. Is it possible that there was another ending of Mark that somehow got chopped off or lost? Given the passage of time and the means by which these texts multiplied and were copied, it seems like it could be possible, but there's really no evidence of that beyond that general discomfort 
that this could actually, in fact, be the ending as intended by the original author, who, by the way, may or may not have been named Mark. I mean, it's a great name. I have a personal affinity for it, but there really is no textual evidence of the specific author either. So back to this original ending, where the women fled, were afraid, and told no one the end. Why does it leave us scratching our heads? A few weeks ago, when we were looking at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, I mentioned that Mark does not include the birth of Jesus, the angels, the shepherds, the wise men, Mary and Joseph. Well, we see here that the ending of the Gospel of Mark is also very different from the other Gospels. You may remember in Matthew, Luke, and John such details as angels in dazzling clothes, the women leaving the tomb with fear and great joy, and sharing the good news with the Gospels, with the disciples, excuse me. Jesus appears to multiple people in a variety of places in the other Gospels, including a room with no open doors and on a fishing trip. Jesus gives instructions and assurance of his spirit to his followers and visibly ascends to heaven, the end. But not in Mark. No joy, no sharing of the news, no appearances of Jesus, no instructions from Jesus. The message to the women by the young fellow in the tomb is, number one, Jesus is risen and is not here, and number two, go tell the others that you can find him in Galilee, as he already told you. But they are trembling and bewildered and afraid. In other translations, terror and amazement had seized them. They were confused and shaking with fear. They were overcome with terror and dread. The message, they got out as fast as they could beside themselves, their heads swimming. Stunned, they said nothing to anyone. Confused, flabbergasted, gobsmacked, paralyzed, silent. This is a liminal space, an in-between space that the women find themselves, caught between their previous understanding of the life of Jesus and a new understanding that is just beginning to be revealed. In between life as they knew it and new life potential that is surprising, worrying, perplexing. I wonder if they are thinking, how dare we move into something new when we are still grieving that which was? That space can create anxiety, but also creativity. It can create fear, but also new revelation. Scholar and theologian Gail O'Day writes the following about this section of Mark. In the face of theophany, a revelation of God, silence is not a failed or inadequate response. Silence is a wholly appropriate response because the women's silence creates a space for the voice and presence of God to resound. What adequate words can the women speak that would not trivialize the moment? that would not make the empty tomb into a story about what they have seen instead of being a moment about what God has done. The women's restraining and Mark's parallel restraint in recounting the Easter story combine to create and allow a moment of holy awe for the reader of the gospel. There is power in the silence to allow God's presence to become known to allow God to work, to allow space for the mystery and awe that connect us to the sacred presence and activity of God. 
I've asked a few questions during this series about liminality. Earlier in June, I asked, why are you here? Last week, I asked, who do we say Jesus is, and who would Jesus say we are? And today I ask, what is God doing here in this new beginning? We can mourn the past, our points of pain, our frustrations, and lament what used to be. And that is natural and normal and human, and space is allowed for that. But let's not get so hung up there that we are not able to be here. What new thing is God about? What is stirring, perhaps not even yet formed into words, maybe just sensed, energy that is beginning to bubble up somewhere, creativity that is emerging in this space in between? What does Mark have to say about it? It seems like he says pretty much nothing. The women are trembling, bewildered, afraid, and they fled the tomb. They didn't just leave, they fled and said nothing to anyone. The end. And yet, this is obviously not the end. I mean, it's the original end words of the Gospel of Mark, but it's not the end of the story. We wouldn't all be sitting here if it were the end of the story. As we read this ending to the Gospel of Mark, we forget that there is another character present, us, the people of God, the followers of Christ. We are seeing and reading and hearing and feeling it all, which begs the question, what is our role? What is ours to do? How are we to share the good news? I pulled out the textbook that I used in my New Testament, bless you, class at Bethany with Professor Dan Ulrich. And I have a note in the margin when we discussed this ending, no doubt from the words of Dan Ulrich himself, that says, prompts back to gospel's beginning. And so I went back to the beginning of Mark. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. From the very start, the gospel of Mark has eased us into a new beginning, a new message of hope, a new way of love, facilitated by that John the Baptist guy, remember him, and fully lived into by Jesus. And when that message, that story is unclear, when we fall silent and aren't sure where to turn, what do we do? A puzzling or particularly gripping ending often leads us to start again from the beginning. Much as we might do when we reach the end of a particularly good novel or television series or a movie or poem, go back to the beginning. Do you know that feeling? when you've gotten to the end of a good book or a movie and you just don't want to let it go. You want to know what's next, what happens to the characters, how they develop. There is that moment of liminality between the end of one world and the beginning of another. You are changed by the experience of entering this other world, but the time inevitably comes when the last page or the final screen appears. The end. We want to hear it, read it, watch it again. What did we miss the first time? What is now more clear, more obvious, more instructive, now that we know the ending? It's almost a different experience when you read it or watch it again, when you know what's coming next. Small things that you missed the first time start becoming more crystallized. Mark may not tell us that the women or the disciples or others saw the risen Jesus with their own eyes. But perhaps this is even more useful for us 2,000 years later 
to understand that Jesus is very visible around us, even if we can't see him with our own eyes. His work, and more specifically, his work through us, is the witness that emerges from the silence. The end points to the beginning. The women left, gobsmacked and silent. And then, John the Baptist came ahead of Jesus, preparing the way. Jesus goes ahead of the disciples, preparing the way. Generations upon generations of faithful Christians and the earliest brethren and even the founders of this congregation went ahead of us, preparing the way. In what way are we now called to prepare the way to usher in the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the world around us? I think it's just the beginning. In order to more clearly see the potential in that beginning, we must continue to work through the things that we continue to carry, the things that weigh us down. We are forever shaped by the moments of life which create pain and sorrow, as well as the moments that create joy and celebration. But we tend to hang on to the challenges and the difficult feelings more readily than the positive memories and experiences. Perhaps this is part of being human. Working through grief does not mean that we forget what has happened in the past and that we do not learn from those experiences. But sometimes, perhaps, we can begin to loosen our grasp. Maybe we don't need to clutch it quite as tightly. We can acknowledge the continued memory of painful life interactions and intersections while also choosing to turn and face forward, moving together down a new path of hope and promise, beginning again. We never run out of those opportunities for a restart. We've purchased some special paper, and at the end, on the inside of each of the pews, you should find a small paper pile of those paper slips and some writing utensils. Now, I mathematically could not predict where people would sit. Some pews will have too much, some pews will not have enough, so we might need to do some passing around. But I would encourage you to pass those down the bench so that everyone has one slip of paper. If we get desperate, some of the larger ones can be torn in half, that's fine, you won't ruin it. And a writing utensil. Hopefully some of you have some. Everyone should have a slip of paper and a writing utensil. There's a couple benches in the center on this side where no one is sitting, so we can grab a couple from there if needed. Is there anybody who, st if you still need a paper, can you raise your hand? Does everyone have a little paper? And I want to preface this by saying, no one else will see your paper. I promise. And I'm going to ask you to take a moment and write on this paper slip something, just one thing, that you grieve, something particularly challenging or difficult for you at this time. It can be something relating to our congregational life together, or it can be something connected to your own personal life or the world around us. Something that you are struggling to release, something that is holding you back. You may not even be sure you're ready to let go of it yet, or at least loosen your grasp. But maybe you sense that your soul is inviting you to do so. Go ahead and write that in whatever words you want to use on that piece of paper. You can even use an image if words fail you. No one else is going to see it, and when you're done, just fold it in half.
a moment, Beth is going to begin playing the piano. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask when that music begins, as you are ready, that you take your slip of paper and find one of the basins around the room. There are two here, and I believe there are two in the middle, all on the sides, where you can put your paper in and just give it a little stir. <clears throat> there is nothing magical about this activity. What you have written on your paper, the concept, the idea, the pain, will not magically disappear. But it is symbolic, an opportunity to experience individually and all together in this community that we are ready, ready to take the next step in whatever God has in store for us. I hope you find it an opportunity to release or begin to release or continue to release that which might be causing you pain, that which might be keeping you stuck in the end. The music that Beth will be playing is the tune to the next hymn we will sing, which will be number 640, 640. And the title is, This is a Day of New Beginnings. We're not gonna sing it, she's gonna play it a couple times through. And then when I sense that we are all ready, ready, I will come back up and I will start us in singing. I think it's probably a new song for most of us, but hopefully as you hear it, it will become familiar. So for now, we will just listen to the music while we stir our papers in the basins. And when you see the lyrics appear on the screen, you'll know that we will be starting to sing momentarily. Let's just take a moment of prayer before we move into this time. God, healer, creator, alpha and omega, end and beginning. Lift our pain and grief, carry, a, carry it with us, and carry us as we carry it. Prepare us to prepare the way. Ready our hearts for your new beginning. In Jesus' name, amen.